and welcome to this week's video. Um, sorry about the length of time in between videos. I'm going to try to get on a better schedule of having one at least once every week or two weeks. Um, so be sure if there's anything like biology related that you want to know about, that you have questions about, be sure to, you know, send me a message on either Facebook or, you know, comment here and I'll see what I can do about getting something made. Um, today what I want to do is I want to look at Punnett squares. Um, if you've taken any kind of biology class, even, uh, even all the way back to high school biology, you probably come across these. You can kind of see where I've got one up there on the board that we'll work with a little later. Um, so, Punnett squares come in handy when looking at the possible offspring of two parents. As long as we know the genetic makeup of the parents, we can look at the possibilities of the genetic makeup of the offspring. Uh, so, before we get into how the Punnett squares are actually used, I think it might be a good idea to know a little bit about how they came into being. Um, Reginald Punnett is the gentleman who came up with the Punnett Squares. Uh, he was a 20th century geneticist. Uh, he originally started at Cambridge University as a medical student. And he ended up graduating with a degree in zoology. Um, while studying at Cambridge as a researcher, he helped to develop the study of genetics with the work that he did with Mendelian genetics. Uh, it was during this time that he developed the Punnett Square as, as well as he helped to establish the Hardy-Weinberg Law. Um, and we'll look at discussing Hardy-Weinberg equation in a later video. Uh, so what exactly is a Punnett Square? It's a tool that's used to help determine the potential genetic makeup of the offspring of two known parents. Uh, the parental generation is known as the P generation. Um, and the... Uh, typically, you're looking at the capital letters being dominant alleles, whereas the lowercase letters are the recessive alleles. Let me see here. Go ahead and point this up a little bit here. Hopefully you can see. There we go. Move a little bit closer. So in this case, my parental generate my parental uh alleles are going to be, I've got one parent as dominant and one parent as recessive. So as you can see, I put my dominant up here and I put my recessive over on the left hand side. So now what's going to happen is we're going to bring these down and across like this. So we'll end up in this case, we'll have them all like this. So we have one dominant and one recessive allele in each of our possibilities. Now in this case, that would mean that there is a 100% chance that our offspring, our F1 generation, will be like this. Okay? So now... Now that we've determined our parental and our F1 generation, which is F1 is just simply the offspring of the parental generation, we can now look at our F2 generation, which is just the, um, if the uh, F1 offspring were crossbred. Typically, this is done a lot of times with plants. Mendel did a lot with his pea plants. So now that we've got our F1 generation of A, A, capital and lowercase a, like so, I don't know if you can see that or not, but we'll go ahead and put it in our square. I'm going to go ahead and use it. No, I'm going to stay with this color. So we'll have one parent here, dominant and recessive, one parent here, dominant and recessive. Excuse me. So, we've got one offspring that will get two dominant alleles. We have two offsprings that will get a dominant and a recessive allele. And then we'll have one offspring 
that will get two recessive alleles. So in this case, we have a 25% chance that our offspring will be, will both be, will have two dominant alleles. A 50% chance that our offspring will have one dominant and one recessive allele. And then we'll also have a 25% chance that our last offspring will have two recessive alleles. So this is where you can see where the recessive uh, phenotype will come back into play. Um, and this is known as the F2 generation. Um, don't know if you can see that. Here, I'll put this up a little bit closer, kind of give you a better idea of what we're looking at. And there you are. So you can kind of see what the Punnett squares are used for. Now, typically, uh, Punnett squares, you're not going to use it for any more than um, one or two uh, traits or alleles. Um, you know, you can, you can do it for more, but it's usually not recommended. You want to see one with two traits. We can do that real quick. So why don't we go ahead and do that. Now, <coughs> excuse me, our parental generation does not have to be a homozygous uh, dominant cross with a homozygous recessive. It can be a heterozygous cross. So let's say we're looking at this allele A and allele B. So we've got a heterozygous for allele A and a heterozygous for allele B. And we're going to cross that with we're going to cross it with a homozygous uh, dominant parent, uh, parent for both genes. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our pairings. So we can have from this one, well from this one we could have both dominant. We could have A dominant and B recessive. We could have A recessive and B dominant, or A recessive and B recessive. And obviously on this one, our, we're going to have both of them are going to be dominant for both genes. So we're going to do a 4x4 four four this time instead of a 2x2. Two two. So, sorry guys, we're going to do, we're going to have a B, A, B, dominant A, recessive B, recessive A, recessive B. On this side, and then along the top we'll have just all of them will be dominant. I really hope you guys can kind of see this. So now we're going to do our crosses. So we've got two dominant A's and two dominant B's in this first one. Let me get a different color. I'm going to go with this really pretty green. Same here. So all across here we're going to have everything's going to be homozygous dominant. Oh, that's even worse. I'll switch back to black. <laughs> so, all across this top row, everything's going to be homozygous dominant. Okay. Now in our second row, we've got a recessive uh, A and a dominant B paired with a dominant A and a dominant B. So we'll have recessive, or we'll have dominant recessive, and then 
heterozygous or homozygous or uh, dominant for the B gene. Same thing is going to happen here. It's going to be heterozygous for A and homozygous dominant for B. And it's going to be like that all the way across. Now on our next one, we've got homozygous for A, heterozygous for B. And it's going to be like that all the way across. And on the last one, it's just going to be heterozygous for both A and B all the way across. So you can kind of see here, let me get you a little closer, how the Punnett square works with two genes, or two alleles, sorry. Um, but that's really it for the Punnett squares. Um, I highly recommend that if you have not uh, worked with them, or if you're still a little unsure of yourself with the Punnett squares, definitely look into them. Definitely practice them. It will come in super handy. Um, but you can also use this to, um, to look at the inheritance pattern of two different alleles or two different genes. Um, when we use a Punnett square that's looking at two different alleles, typically these alleles will be linked somehow during inheritance. Um, so it can be studied this way. Uh, kind of neat, you know, I like them, they, t you typically don't look at more than two genes on a Punnett square, otherwise your Punnett square gets really huge and really complicated. <laughs> um, so that's really it for Punnett squares. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to message me on my Facebook page or you can comment here below. As always, I will post my, uh, sources down below. And, <coughs> excuse me, and you are more than welcome to message me, check out the sources that I, that I use, because it gives a lot of good information. Um, and again, if you like this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up and subscribe so that you can see more of them. Alright, bye. Mwah.